Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy and today I'm very honored and excited to be interviewing a very special space champion, Dr. John Logston. Dr. Logston is an educator, author, analyst, and historian of the presidential decisions that have shaped the U.S. space program since its inception. He is often referred to as the Dean of Space Policy. He has been based at the George Washington University at the Space Policy Institute of George Washington's Elliott School of International Affairs. He founded the Space Policy Institute in 1987 and directed it until leaving active facility status, faculty status in 2008. In the years since, he has published three in-depth studies of presidential decision-making regarding the space program. Dr. Logston is also, was also a member of the Board of Directors of the Planetary Society. In 2003, he was also a member of the Columbia Accident Inve Investigation Board and formerly was a member of the NASA Advisory Council. I'm so excited to be able to understand Dr. Logston's journey and what inspired him to go into the space industry. So welcome. Thank you so much for taking your time to inspire the next generation. Happy to be with you. Yeah, before we get into understanding what excites you about space and how you got into public policy, could you tell us more about your typical day? How does it usually run? Well, as you said in your introduction, I left active teaching in 2008. So I, I only occasionally go to the university. I still keep a desk there. I've been associated with GW for 51 years, which is a long time. Uh, so my typical day, uh, what I should add right now, I'm in the middle of moving. Uh, and, and so that's kind of totally consumed me for the past few months. So that's not the typical day. The typical day is I spend time uh, re researching and writing. I'm working on a project on uh, the decisions by pe uh, presidents after Ronald Reagan uh, that have shaped the space program. So kind of complete the, the cycle uh, that I started with Kennedy, Nixon, and, and Reagan. Uh, so I have the home office. We'll have a home office in the new location. Uh, the only problem is I like to use presidential documents, and all the presidential libraries are still closed because of the pandemic. So uh, my progress has been slower than I had hoped. Yeah, it's amazing that you're continuing this series of books and kind of shedding light on your perspective using these historical documents of how space policy has really developed. And so that leads me to my next question, which is uh, you started the international, like the public policy sector at George Washington. So I'm curious what led you to doing that and how did you discover you know, the importance of space policy for university students? Well, uh, it goes back to uh, my graduate student days. Uh, I had got a first degree in physics <coughs> and never really did any physics. Uh, I, I was working as a technical writer on uh, military weapon systems. This is the early 1960s, a long time ago. And I was getting bored with that. I didn't see myself doing it the rest of my life and, and decided I should go back to graduate school. Then the question is, with a degree in physics, what discipline to go, go to graduate school in. And I got fascinated with political science, mainly because of some interactions with colleagues at MIT who were combining technology and politics. And I said, well, I've got the science and technology part, so let's try politics. So I decided, oh, I guess uh, in early 1962, to apply to New York University uh, in political science. So that's step one. Step two is John Glenn. Uh, Senator Glenn made the first US orbital flight in February of 1962. At that point, I was working in Midtown Manhattan and I went to see his parade on March the 1st, 62. He, rode through Manhattan in an open car, even though it was March, uh, uh, with Vice President uh, Lyndon Johnson seated next to him. And I said, hey, this space stuff, uh, what is it all about? Uh, and, and it captured my attention and the excitement uh, of doing new things. 
So when I went back and when I started graduate school in September of 1962, it's a long time ago, uh, I started writing my graduate course papers on the politics of space uh, from, from the get-go. Uh, and I ended up with a dissertation uh, about John Kennedy's decision to go to the moon. Uh, I started it in 67 and was pretty well done in 1969. And even before I defended the dissertation, I had a book contract with MIT Press to publish the book. It finally got published in 1970. Uh, but uh, the fact that I had done this, I had talked to everybody that was involved in the decision that was still alive. Unfortunately, both John and Robert Kennedy were dead by then. Uh, the only people I didn't interview were Lyndon Johnson, uh, President Lyndon Johnson at that point, and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Uh, but uh, maybe to end this long-winded thing, uh, ha having done all of this and become visible to NASA, I got an invitation to the Apollo 11 launch. So I was there, and uh, on launch day, I went out and watched the astronauts leave their uh, crew quarters and walk on their way to the moon. And then I'm in a lot of photographs of the actual launch. And, you know, there's nothing going to be better than that in my lifetime for me. So, uh, again, that's a long winded story of how I got uh, captured by the excitement of space and decided to focus my career on it. Wow, that's absolutely incredible. There were like two main points that I really was intrigued when you were saying the first part was the intersection between physics and policy. One thing I love about the space industry is how it's so interdisciplinary. I personally have always been interested in medicine and biology, and I, then I discovered my passion for space. And so now I'm able to really combine them to go into like aerospace medicine. And like that, there's so many careers where it's so interdisciplinary, which I love. Um, and the second point was how a space, um, you know, you were saying how the importance of space policy, I 100% agree. A lot of the things and work we are doing these days relies on space policy. So I'm glad that you were able to pioneer that at George Washington University. It's absolutely incredible. Well, yeah, I mean, I was doing space policy from the time I actually started teaching at Catholic University in 1966 did my dissertation um, while I was still at Catholic, uh, but didn't start teaching courses focused on space until I got to GW, uh, which already had a research program on issue, policy issues in science and technology. So I and, and a colleague brought the space focus there. Uh, so I, I was teaching students with respect to space policy, space history, well before the Space Policy Institute was created in 1987. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah, that, that's awesome, though. And, you know, another one of your really cool experiences was being a part of the Columbia um, Accident Investigation Board. And so I'm curious to hear your experiences on that. And if you could share anything about how, how you came across that. And was that like a cool experience to be a part of? Well, uh, it's, it's a somewhat complicated story. Uh, when the accident uh, happened, uh, I was at my desk at GW, and one of my students came in and said, my God, uh, turn on the television, look what just happened. And I had already been somewhat established as, as what we call a talking head, a, a, a commentator on, on space matters. Uh, and so the next couple of days, I had two people taking phone calls of people asking for interviews, running from one place to another. I remember running into the NBC Channel 4 studio here in Washington, and they rushed me and sat me down at a desk uh, with a camera on me. And then I looked next to me, and it was Tom Brokaw, uh, the NBC anchor. So uh, my involvement in the accident for the first couple of months was talking about it. Then I got a phone call from the person who had been named chair of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, 
which I'll call Cade. That's what we call it uh, uh, all the time. Uh, Admiral, retired Admiral Hal Gaiman. And I said, oh, Admiral Gaiman, uh, how can I help? Uh, you know, what, 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 what do you, thoughts do you want? And he says, no, I, I want you to join the board. We've decided that this was really a policy failure. And I, I had gotten to know Gaiman on other assignments uh, prior to the accident. And he said, we won't move. We actually, the existing members of the board took a vote and they said you were the best policy person to join the board. Uh, and so he invited me to become a member of ultimately, uh, there were 13 members of the board, uh, the most famous of whom was Sally Ride. Uh, we had a Nobel Prize winner uh, in Doug Osheroff, uh, who was a little crazy, uh, like Feynman on the uh, Challenger accident board. It was a really intense experience. I mean, you were doing dealing with something horrible, but there was an esprit de corps uh, among the board, and we had maybe 150 people supporting the, the 13 board members. So it was a big operation. Uh, one of our people found a spare airplane that uh, belonged, I think, to the Air Force. Uh, and so we had our own airplane uh, for, for all the traveling we did. Uh, uh, we had logos, uh, so so it was a team effort, and I think our uh, report, which was released in August of 2003, really changed the trajectory, uh, not only of the shuttle program, but of the space program overall. Yeah, that sounds like a really intense experience, but also one that's very memorable. And, you know, a lot of the a purpose of this interview is also to show students that there's various ways to get into a certain career. And you're very well versed in policy. Did you ever go to law school or were you into political science? Uh, political science, most people these days, given these books that you talked about in the introduction, think I'm a historian. I never had a graduate course in history. Uh, you know, I tell people I write political history with the emphasis on political. Uh, so it's kind of narrative of how we got to where we are. Uh, uh, I don't do anything technical anymore. The advantage of the bachelor's degree in physics is I'm not intimidated by technical language or, or dealing with, with uh, science or, uh, or technology subjects. But I don't do them. I don't teach about them. Uh, so it's really a policy program that happens to focus on the exciting area of space. That's, that's awesome. It's nice to know that you don't have to just become or go to law school in order to get into space policy. There's history, there's also political science, and there's various pathways. So. Well, I would comment that the lawyers are a problem. Oh. Uh, but they see space activities through the lenses of law. And uh, that's a pretty narrow focus for something that is so multidimensional. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good perspective. I haven't thought about that, but definitely I can see there's, it's really nice to also hear those different perspectives though and see how, even though you're kind of in the same realm, how every person thinks so differently based off like your degree. Yeah, indeed. I mean, there's yeah. nothing wrong with space law. It just doesn't interest me very much. Yes, of course. For example, lawyers, space lawyers are still arguing, and it's relevant these days, where does space begin? Uh, you know, what is the lower boundary of outer space? Because these uh, suborbital flights of Virgin Galactic and, and Blue Origin uh, are going to different altitudes and, and there's an argument about uh, are they really going to space or not? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, another point that you did bring up in your earlier response was how um, Don Glenn's flight really excited you and made you be like, oh, you know, I should get into the space sector more. I should get, in, you know, get involved with what's happening. And that's what excites me about the private um, commercialization of space and how it brings more traction into the industry and how more, you know, kids and students are able to see on the news more space related content and space launches. What are your thoughts on, you know, commercialization in space? Well, uh, frankly, it bores me. Uh, I, I'm an aficionado of 
of space exploration, of going new places, preferably with people. Uh, and so I've been waiting for now uh, the Mars almost 50 years for the next people to go to the moon. Uh, but, but the things that, that we do with our robotic probes throughout the solar system, and the Webb telescope launching next month, I think is, well, no, it's not October yet. So launching in November, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the projects that excite me. Making money doing things in space is a good thing. And it provides a lot more opportunities, but it's not what gets me turned on. I, 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 I want to say, go new places, see new things, uh, know the people. I mean, I've had the good fortune of knowing uh, many, many space explorers. I knew Neil Armstrong rather well, and I knew Mike Collins rather well, and, and Buzz, Buzz's son was one of my students. So, oh. uh, you know, we had Buzz wander into the offices every once in a while. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I definitely that's a very unique perspective, but I actually agree. And, you know, I'm really excited for the NASA Artemis mission. And hopefully one day, you know, maybe in a few years, we can send humans to Mars as well. I think we have a long way to go. But I think that exploration and the innovation that occurs when we're sending humans to different planets and different areas in the solar system is just intriguing and exciting. I think it's one of the great adventures of humanity. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, and you know, putting up uh, a, a 10,000 unit communication constellation probably is good for society. It's going to make a lot of money potentially for the people that uh, succeed in putting these constellations up. But it's business, it's just business in a different location. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it definitely, you know, when you're, I think a lot more business is occurring in the industry these days because of the private privatization, um, which does provide more job opportunities. But yes, there's always this back and forth of the negative and positive aspects. Yeah. Well, but at least, you know, young people, you, others have the opportunity with small satellites to actually get close uh, to hardware uh and 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 uh, uh get involved in, in the doing of space not just uh, uh being excited by it but actually doing it yes 100 percent. and so we talked about a few of the really cool projects that you have been a part of so um, i'm curious is there like a ex uh, what is the most exciting project that you've ever worked on is it one of your books or is it uh, something that we already talked about well, it's, I mean, I'm very proud of the books because I think uh, uh, you, you said I wrote the books. So let's, let's say what they are. Uh, uh, since I uh, left teaching in 2010 was John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon. Then in 2015, after Apollo, Richard Nixon and the American Space Program. And then in 2019, was Ronald Reagan in the space frontier. Uh, the research in primary documents and in talking to people who were there uh, when these decisions were made is, is really exciting. Uh, I go back and uh, I said this earlier, I mean, those most exciting single experience was J July the 16th, 1969 as being present at the launch of Apollo 11. Uh, you know, seeing the first men, and they were all men, uh, leave this planet to go to another place. It's only going to happen once. And I was there. So that, that's a cool memory. Yes, 100%. I would have loved to be on that near that launch or see it in person. I think that would have been incredible. So I'm glad that you were able to experience that. Um, and so did you always imagine yourself in the position you are in today, or did you kind of have obstacles that changed your direction apart from going from a physics to political science degree? And if you did have obstacles in your journey that kind of led you in a different direction, how were you able to overcome your obstacles? Well, none of this was planned. It just happened. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, so you say obstacles. I don't think there were many obstacles in the way. Uh, uh, I mean, the thing I would say to people that want to work in this area is do good work. 
I mean, uh, I did a good job in graduate school. I picked a good topic for my dissertation that, that I'm still in a sense living on by writing about uh, Kennedy's decision to go to the moon. Once I found myself in Washington at Catholic University, I discovered that George Washington was a better place for what I wanted to do. And so it took me two, two and a half years to find a path from Catholic to GW. So in a sense, that was an obstacle was getting to be where I wanted to be. And, and then things just followed. Uh, uh, I mean, a university career is a wonderful career uh, because of this institution called tenure. After a couple of years, you have total job security, so you can just focus on your work. Uh, and, and, and I didn't really know that when I decided to go into an academic career. It, 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 it really has just flowed, I guess is the right way to say it. Yeah, I'm so glad that you were able to find and still teach and go into the academic profession, as well as focus on the other side projects you did have. And, you know, you've been a part of the industry for many years. And so you've seen really, you know, the start of some exciting projects and you're looking into the future of what's going to happen into the space industry. So you have probably a really, you know, nice perspective that you could probably share with us. So my question for you is, how do you foresee the space industry changing maybe in 20 years from now? Well, I think the private sector will play a much larger role. It's, uh, certainly near Earth orbit will be fully privatized. There will be very little government activity uh, in the immediate vicinity of this home planet. Uh, 20 years from now, what is that? 2041. Uh, yes. <laughs> I hope we've taken the first steps on Mars and have permanent outposts on the moon. Uh, uh, and, and that, I think, is going to be a cooperation between the governments, the public sector and the private sector, public pipe, poof, that's hard to say, public-private partnerships, uh, I think, are the way forward. And, and a lot of international cooperation, both in uh, government, between governments and among uh, private sector firms. So I think it's going to be uh, a, a interesting and hopefully a uh, very changed and exciting environment. Uh, you know, I hope we get to the moon and find out it's worth being there. We don't really know that. That's the reason to go back, is to discover whether there are resources there that can be used, uh, or whether the location is uh, uh, have certain advantages. There are people who want to put radio telescopes on the far side of the moon, for example, because that's not subject to all the crap that comes from television uh, broadcast uh, here on Earth. Uh, pardon. Uh, uh, so we'll see. I mean, uh, uh, I've said over and over again over the years, I want to be for the next human launch to the moon at the crew quarters watching the next crew walk by me. And I've got my fingers crossed that that will happen while I'm still able to stand and be there. Yeah, I'm so excited for the NASA Artemis mission. I, I know like I, I would be very excited to see that happening and I'm excited to just see the next people go onto the moon. And you bring up a really good point about international collaboration and how not only do we have to see private and government agencies working together, but potentially like you know, different countries working together. Do you think that this is actually in the state we are in right now, a viable thing? Because I feel like space has really started because of a space race between countries trying to almost compete with each other. So do you think that it's viable for international cooperation between government agencies? Well, I, I get asked a lot, is, is there a new space race, particularly between the United States and China? And I say, no, there is certainly competition. Uh, but a race has a finish line, uh, and there's a winner and a loser. Competition, everybody can win. Uh, you know, and 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 the the competition stimulates uh, activity, stimulates uh, extra behavior. So I think definitely we are in an era of mixed cooperation and competition. 
I mean, we have the uh, example of the International Space Station, 15 countries working together now for 20 years in orbit. Uh, um, and and uh, now China has its space station and is inviting other countries to uh, at least send their people there, if not participate in, in the management of it. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be a, uh, be, it's going to be a sector that requires a lot of policy people. <laughs> for one thing, that, you know, put in the commercial for the Space Policy Institute. You, you haven't said, and again, I'll say it for commercial purposes, commercial, for boasting, I guess. Space Policy Institute, GW's Elliott School of International Affairs, is basically the only place in the United States where people from all disciplinary backgrounds can do graduate work in space policy and go on to active careers uh, in the sector, in the industry, in government. We give a master's degree and some of our students go on to a doctorate. Uh, and, and so if you are intrigued by space policy, GW is the place to be. Yeah, I was looking to George Washington's program and it's absolutely phenomenal. And it's located perfectly in DC, right near the Capitol, right near, you know, where all the policy things really seem to be happening. So it definitely is a great, you know, school that I'm sure a lot of students would like to go to. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, people ask me how, how rough is it to get admitted to our program? And my answer is if you're smart enough to find us, you're probably smart enough to be admitted. Uh, so uh, we, we admit 15 to 20 students a year. Uh, so it's not large numbers because there aren't that many jobs, but all of our students uh, have succeeded if they want to uh, in, in, in finding good positions in some aspect of space activity. Yeah, that's incredible. I didn't realize it was such a small number of students selected. That, that's crazy, yeah. And so my next question for you is what makes you nervous and excited for the future of the industry? I know you said you were excited about the next mission to go back to the moon, but what makes you nervous? Well, there are a couple of things. One is uh, the current bubble of excitement about commercial payoffs. You know, what if there's no there there in ideas like space mining and 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 you know, asteroid extracting precious metals from uh, asteroids and, and uh, solar power from space. Some of the rather grandiose uh, proposals to make a lot of money using space resources. Uh, I think that still is very speculative. And if there's no there, there, other than the applications we already have of Earth observation, communications which happen near the earth then then the space boom won't be a boom it'll become a bust so that's one thing another thing is is uh, the always lurking possibility of an accident uh, because space is hard you're in order to get it into space you have to accelerate to 17,000 miles a second and that involves controlling energy that's the rough equivalent of a small atomic bomb that you're sitting on top of in a rocket, especially a big one. Uh, and, and, and so what will happen after the next accident? Uh, will we continue to go forward as we did after Challenger, as we did after Columbia? Uh, you know, so, so that makes me nervous uh, because uh, uh, the shuttle was supposed to be routine, was sold as routine. It was never routine, but uh, it was a risky business and, and uh, space continues to be a risky business. Yeah, that's a really great point. Right now we have so much momentum in the industry and you know a lot of commercialization. I know we do have a lot of regulations in place, but we never know when something wrong could happen and how that would affect the whole industry and overall. So that's, you know, definitely a precaution that we all should keep in mind. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, we don't have uh, the equivalent of airlines going to space yet. 
uh, yeah. <laughs> with, with that level of re reliability and, and ease of operation. Uh, it's, uh, just because of the laws of, of uh, gravity and physics, uh, it's always going to be hard. Yes, of course. First it was the cars, then it was the airplanes, and hopefully once it'll be more normalized to launch into space, but we're definitely not there yet. Right. And my last and final question for you is you've given plenty of advice and you've been through a lot, you know, in the space industry and you've had some twists and turns in your journey. And so my final question for you is what last piece of advice would you give to high school or um, college students about pursuing a career in the STEM industry, space sector, really anything they want to be, something that you wish you knew when you were younger? Oh, when I was younger, there wasn't a space industry after all. Uh, I, I was in college when Sputnik was launched in 1957. So, uh, you know, I grew up before we started doing things in space. Uh, I think the best advice is, is to do whatever you choose to do well. Uh, it, it certainly helps to have some level of technical familiarity, uh, if, if, even if you want to pursue a, a path that's non-technical, because it, it is uh, uh, technical literacy that's going to define the future that all of you folks are going to live in. Yeah, amazing advice. I think, you know, do whatever you want, but when you do it, do it with your best effort and passion is definitely advice that we should all follow and keep in mind. And I want to thank you so much for taking your time to share your journey and insights with us. It was absolutely incredible talking with you. Well, thanks for asking me and good luck. Thank you.